Okay, okay. Well, Becca came to us uh, several years ago. Um, she's been a, a good light to us, and we have really enjoyed her being part of our uh, fellowship. And, um, you know, this, this whole program is kind of centered around what she has decided to do today. And she's engulfed her life in the animals as well. So welcome, Becca. Hey, everyone. Well, my name is Becca. Um, just a little bit of intro. I did graduate from EKU, studied wildlife management there, did my associates in wildlife management as well. And I've been working with creatures for a long time. Uh, so from doggy daycares, when I was still in high school, I worked as a dog trainer through college for a while. I've worked at wildlife rehab centers and research stations and animal shelters. And right now I work at Shaker Village out on the farm. So getting to do livestock and outdoor education every day has been a lot of fun here lately. <laughs> so I appreciate you guys coming on this journey with me as we explore humanity's investigation into our fellow animals and the earth with which we share them. <laughs> so going into sort of the introductory of historic humanities, animal worship, where does that even come from? That's been a question a lot of people have asked, and there's a lot of different theories about how people or when people first started admiring or worshiping animals. The first theory, uh, we'll talk about three because there's so many, so we'll hit on just a few of them, and they're all very contrasting, so maybe you'll find one you like. But <laughs> uh, contrasting views and a UU, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so, the first theory it was actually put out by a first century Greek historian um, named Diodorus, and he actually just um, proposed that people began worshiping animals when the gods, attempting to hide from giants, came down to earth and hid themselves as disguised by, as animals. And so even when the gods felt safe and went back up into the heavens and were no longer disguised as animals, people still continued to worship them. There's the first theory about why we have worshiped animals. <laughs> and a second one from 1906 is kind of one that I favor, and that's Johann Weissenborn, who proposed that worship of animals resulted through human curiosity and observations of appealing traits that inspired wonder. He thought that worship stemmed from an adoration of unique or unusual animal characteristics. But most recently, in 2005, another theory yet again says that uh, John Lubbock, that animals uh, began being worshipped after family names. So if your last name was something like Fox or runs with platypus, then <laughs> your family <laughs> might begin to elevate that creature over other creatures. And that is how he proposed his animal worship came about. So I'm sure there's lots of ideas, but those are a few different ones. Um, that have kind of come about from the beginning of time. <laughs> and so as we associate with wild animals relating to worship, when it comes to wild animals, we do, we marvel at the traits humans will never have. Uh, in Southeast Asia, the tiger is the king of the jungle, and it's not uncommon um, to see him, statues of the tiger, uh, set in Vietnam outside of buildings where he is a guardian for the inhabitants or maybe the sacred grounds where he symbolizes regalness and strength and his ferocity. So we do elevate these traits that we seek or desire or admire in animals. Birds are a common theme culturally throughout the world that people elevate. Um, they're viewed as messengers from God in lots of cultures, not just Noah and the dove, but also the natives of Borneo who wait for the imparted wisdom of the hawk before they'll make important decisions relating to agriculture or work or war. Snakes, on the other hand, <laughs> are, are demonized in some Abrahamic religions, but they're worshipped in other African or Indian religions. Westerners can observe the impact of one animal's cultural demonization through misinformation embedded in our present day societies. Some folks will swerve to intentionally hit a snake on the road, or they'll kill a snake when they find it in their garden, or they'll squirm and wiggle a little when they see one in the room with them. Um, other, pl um, 
other religions like the snake handlers of Eastern Kentucky might hold a snake to cast their sins into or as evidence of holding a venomous snake as God's mercy on them. And so I've worked with a lot of snakes very closely through a wildlife research and rehabilitation station from ringneck snakes, which stay about five inches long, to our teenaged tiger reticulated python. She was 200 pounds and 20 feet long. It took three people carrying her like a shipping rope to move her around. Her name was Tigger. <laughs> and so I've seen a lot of different faces from joy to horror <laughs> as people have encountered snakes through my job experiences. And my, one of my favorites when I worked for Parks and Recreation at McConnell Springs was a visitor when the Nature Center turned into a voting booth. Uh, a visitor refused to enter the voting ballot area upon learning there was a snake in a locked aquarium inside the ballot room. <laughs> and so it always kind of amazes me um, whether or not we think we've moved beyond this um, um, kind of mystical elevation of animals, yet how much power we still give them in our daily lives, even if unwittingly. So wild animals, we do talking about human, human uses of animals and human relationships with animals, so getting into how we relate with wild animals in terms of work. So outside of worship, um, thinking about modern day use of wild animals and relating to work, the present day age of enormous vampire killing crossbows outfitted with the most expensive scopes money can buy disguised in the delightful scent of artificial laboratory urine and nylon camouflage. With fancy mechanized noisemakers to lure in our prey, we find one ethical question imposed on us modern hunters. Is it really fair chase? So the sport of hunting wild animals forces humans to recognize our own physical limitations as predatory creatures who pursue their prey. This leads us to admire and become frustrated with and take pleasure in outwitting animals that are stronger and faster than us, especially when it means putting food on the table or feeding a family. A hunter stalking their target is studying a creature's habits. They build a connection to the land that the, both the hunter and the animal share, and they learn about the secrets of wild things to, to provide for self and family. Modern ethical hunters will practice fair chase as best they can, though this is probably very obviously a biased commentary of hunting. <laughs> but let's not forget about the other ecological services wildlife will provide as well, um, as far as muscle cleaning our water systems and the other things humans might indirectly um, benefit from, but focusing still on our human-centric relationship with animals over time, we'll consider the early hunting gatherers and how much energy they could save if they weren't spending so much time pursuing their prey if their prey didn't run away from them. So thinking about domestic animals, let's go ahead and define domestic. So we have this, all of these concepts about animal terms that we're used to hearing. And just so we have a clear understanding, a domestic animal is defined as anim wild animals brought under the control of humans over a long period of time for the purpose of providing a useful product or service. And domestic plants and animals, they came about around the same time with the origin of agrarian communities around 15,000 years ago. So it's interesting how they've kind of co-popped up along um, with agrarian communities. And an animal can be tame without being domestic. So you can raise a baby deer and socialize it to be friendly with people, but it's not genetically distinct from its wild counterpart and it's not being selectively bred over generations to provide a product or service. It's a tamed down wild animal. But as domestic animals relate to worship, a sacred animal can be protected under religious dietary laws, prohibiting the animal's consumption, like avoiding all meats if you're a Buddhist or avoiding beef if you're a Hindu. But conversely, other animals might be forbidden or treated as unclean or tainted to eat if you're following um, or avoiding to eat pork and under kosher law. A sacred animal might also be sacrificed to glorify or appease the god that the animal embodies. Many religions do consider cows to be sacred. Hinduism, um, the cow is a symbol of wealth and strength and abundance and selfless giving. 
Now, when you consider the services and products a cow provides, even without consumption or beef jerky, <laughs> the cow provides strength to work the fields through plowing, which in turn helps the crops to grow, which thereby brings the keeper of the cow sustenance and monetary opportunities. So the spiritual connectors are logical attributes ascribed to the cow in relation to human success for those who keep cattle. We glorify animals that are providing for us in the sense of domestic animals and worship. Ancient Egyptians also worshiped cats, though it's arguable that the internet still does that to this day. <laughs> <laughs> so why domesticate at all, other than the fact that your food isn't running away from you? There is a more stable food and clothing supply. Selective breeding allows for genetic modifications that will improve production and supply of the product being offered. You can specialize for meat or dairy or wool. And there is an association with denser human populations and established communities alongside livestock. Now, I kind of put a little asterisk there. So this is my personal opinion that it cannot be completely responsible for ending nomadic uh, groups because keep in mind there's livestock herds that are moved seasonally within the United States and think about the Mongols who are herding um, and living nomadically in tribes, um, herding cattle and goats and such. And so while it might be true for Europe, it's not necessarily true for every part of the world. But there are six characteristics of a domestic animal. You want to think about diet, it should be flexible, Herbivores and omnivores are the most sustainable animal to keep. You want a f something that will have a fast growth rate and a short reproduction cycle. And you want something that will breed in captivity. Not everything will breed in captivity. You want something with a predictable and calm disposition, sweet Annie. <laughs> um, and you want something with a stable temperament. Uh, so it wouldn't work very well um, to herd an animal that's so flighty of people, you wanna be able to manipulate and use their flight zones if it's a prey animal when you're kind of directing them around. You want to move them, not scare them. And so it should also have a malleable social hierarchy. So it's important for humans to be able, for a domestic animal to immerse ourselves as a leader in their life so that it makes it safe for humans and animals to interact with when you're trying to perform a job, whether it's guiding a dog to read a book or leading a donkey around for kids to pet. <laughs> Speaking of pets. <laughs> so a pet is an animal that's kept as a companion or for pleasure. So in humans today, we are acknowledging the health and spiritual benefits of keeping animals as companions. This isn't completely a new concept. There are remains of ancient Egyptians being buried with dogs and cats and cattle, but maybe this is a rediscovery. So historically in the United States, domestic animals are utilized as companions for the garden, but today most household pets are treated like members of the family. So perhaps this is the most uh, clever survival strategy. How exactly did cats and dogs train us humans to bring them from out in the cold to inside the house? <laughs> my dog doesn't guard my hut. He's a beagle who's never hunted a rabbit, though in his mind he thinks he could take down a full-size mammoth. <laughs> Rather, he provides other useful services. Over thousands of years, we just made up a critter that can meet our needs on a level of utility, but also now we're learning on a level of emotional well-being. We inadvertently made an animal that will connect with us and engage with us. Why? Because we're social creatures, and dogs are social creatures, and so are the ancestors of dogs. We've matched like keep peas and carrots because we made them that way. One of my favorite stories about um, just how much of an impact a dog can have in our lives is a friend of mine who breeds golden retrievers. She trains them to live as assistance dogs in nursing homes, and she sent one of her golden retrievers to be a companion for a nonverbal autistic five-year-old. And it was their first meeting, and they were in the backyard giving the dog a bath, and the dog shook, it was all wet, and the child laughed and said, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and so I still I always get goosebumps when I hear that story. And so 
we really do um, have such a special relationship with the animals in our lives. Pets soothe us and they keep us active. They give us friendship and unconditional affection. Unless you're my cat, Sally, and I've brought home the wrong flavor of cat food. <laughs> That's 100% conditional. <laughs> So they meet so many of our human needs required to be happy whole people. In a way, you could say we've intentionally co-evolved alongside each other these past 15,000 years. Dogs make for an easy example, but also cats, chickens, donkeys, sheep, even goldfish can all be trained. Anything can learn if we, the human, learn to speak its language with a little time and a lot of patience. It's something we're observing now through how animals learn. For many mammals, it's similar across the board with classical and operant conditioning. Everyone loves a good snack and a little praise after some hard work. So as we learn through science ways we can better communicate with animals and how they service our needs of utility or companionship, it's important to remember that we should also be meeting their needs as well by having a balance of exercise, boundaries, and affection. If one factor is out of sync, sometimes undesirable behaviors can occur. Ed, is this where you talked about Misty? <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so um, as our fascination with animals deepens and our desire to continue building relationships with animals that bring us so much joy continues, we must admit that our adoration is a bit comical. Is it just a different face to the same ancient idolization. We all love our dearest Princess Flufftail III, but it's important in order to meet our pets' basic needs to let them be what they are, animals. The danger of indoor pets becoming fur babies is taking away an animal's right to be an animal. By giving our pets jobs and tasks that, that or offering stimuli that mimic natural behavior, we can keep them happy and healthy and meeting their needs as they continue to meet our needs. So there's still a small voice encouraging me to say, it's okay, you can go ahead and stuff them in the tutu for a picture. It's pretty cute. And after all, our ancient ancestors were probably practicing a similar ritualistic worship anyhow. But thank you guys. <laughs> Discussion.